Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is on infective endocarditis part 1. This video will contain the definition of infective endocarditis followed by discussion about its clinical classifications. We will also talk about etiology and pathogenesis of infective endocarditis. Then in the second part of this series that I will hopefully upload within a week, we will finish our discussion by talking about the morphology, clinical features, diagnosis and management of this disease. Okay, so a lot of topics, so let's begin. First question, what is infective endocarditis? Now, in order to understand infective endocarditis, first we must know what do we mean by the word endocarditis. Now, note that at the end of this word, we have the itis suffix. And if you had seen my videos on inflammation topic, you will recall that the itis suffix denotes inflammation. So the literal meaning of endocarditis is inflammation of the endocardium. Recall that endocardium is a thin serous lining that covers the interior of our heart. For example, as you can see in this image, here I have drawn a very diagrammatic image and this is showing a cross section of a heart. We can see that this is the right atrium of the heart, this is the right ventricle of the heart and note that between the right atrium and right ventricle there is a tricuspid valve and this helps in unidirectional flow of blood. That means blood will flow from right atrium to the right ventricle but not in the opposite direction. Similarly, we can also see in this image that this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle and there is also a valve called mitral valve in between them. And we can also see semilunar valves in the aorta, this is the aorta and this is the semilunar valve in the aorta and also another semilunar valve is seen in the pulmonary trunk. Now always remember these valves as well as the interior or inner surface of the heart chamber is lined by endocardium. And the part of the endocardium that lines the walls of the heart chamber are also called mural endocardium. So now that we have briefly discussed what do we mean by the endocardium and what do we mean by endocarditis, now we are ready to define infective endocarditis. So as written in your textbook, infective endocarditis can be defined as microbial infection of the heart valves or mural endocardium that leads to formation of vegetations composed of thrombotic debris and microorganisms and are often associated with underlying destruction of the cardiac tissues. Okay, I hope you are still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them definitions of pathology. I even have to show them teddy bear to keep them calm. So look, I am also showing you a teddy so look at the teddy, don't run away because I will try to explain this definition line by line now. Okay, so what did we say in the first line of this definition? Infective endocarditis is microbial infection of the heart valve or mural endocardium. And we have already mentioned what do we mean by heart valve and what do we mean by the mural endocardium. So what is happening as a result of this microbial infection? It is resulting in formation of vegetations. Recall from my video on thrombosis that when thrombosis occurs on the heart valves, it is known as vegetation. So here, as a result of 
thrombus formation in the heart valve or endocardium that is resulting in a mass that is called vegetation and it is composed of thrombotic debris and microorganism and what did we say in the last part of the definition that it is often associated with destruction of underlying cardiac tissue particularly when infective endocarditis is occurring due to highly virulent microorganism that can cause significant damage to the underlying tissues and also you have to remember that this infection can also spread to aorta to prosthetic device if those were nearby and to other blood vessels and even in areas of aneurysm so now that we have defined infective endocarditis now we will move on and talk about the clinical classifications of infective endocarditis now infective endocarditis can be clinically classified into acute and subacute forms acute infective endocarditis occurs due to highly virulent microorganism and it usually involves previously normal heart valves in this type of infective endocarditis there is rapid necrosis and destruction in the affected area and therefore it is quite difficult to treat this type of endocarditis with antibiotics alone therefore it will often require surgical intervention and always remember that despite appropriate treatment death may occur within days to weeks in some cases so this is a very dangerous type of infective endocarditis moving on to the subacute variety of infective endocarditis that variety will occur due to less virulent microorganism and that type of endocarditis will usually occur on previously damaged heart valves so always remember the condition of the heart valves for your exam the examiners are very fond of asking which type of infective endocarditis will happen on normal on previously normal heart valves and which type will happen on previously damaged heart valves so now that we have talked about the clinical classification before moving on to the next topic we will summarize the major differences between acute and subacute infective endocarditis so the first one is duration duration of acute infective endocarditis is usually less than six weeks and for the subacute variety it will be longer than six weeks regarding the causative organism the most common organism responsible for acute infective endocarditis is staphylococcus aureus Another important organism that I will mention here is beta hemolytic streptococci. So these are responsible for acute infective endocarditis. And regarding the causative organism of subacute variety, always remember that streptococcus viridens is a very important organism responsible for this subacute variety. Moving on to the condition of the heart valve we have already discussed that acute infective endocarditis usually occurs on previously normal heart valve and the subacute variety will occur on previously damaged heart valve regarding the extent of lesion always remember that in acute infective endocarditis there will be invasive and separative lesion and regarding the subacute variety it will be less invasive and it will be less separative in nature regarding the clinical features in acute infective endocarditis we will see features of systemic infection there will be fever chills weakness etc and regarding the clinical features of subacute infective endocarditis there may be splenomegaly that is the enlargement of spleen 
there may be also clubbing and pedicure. Now, what do we mean by clubbing? Clubbing is a condition that happens in the fingers and toes and here there will be proliferation in the distal soft tissues and that will result in widening of those affected areas and that will result in alteration in the normal curvature of the nail and the nail beds will become highly compressible and the distal parts of the digits will become widened. So that is clubbing and in severe cases the fingers may even look like drumstick. So always remember that thing too. So now that we have talked about the clinical classification and also about the differences between the two types, now we will move on and talk about the etiology of infective endocarditis. So what are the causes of infective endocarditis? First, we will mention the causative microorganisms and then we will also talk about the predisposing factors of infective endocarditis. Now we have already mentioned the names when we were talking about subacute and acute infective endocarditis. So on native but previously damaged heart valves, infective endocarditis is most commonly caused by streptococcus viridans and this type of endocarditis is seen in 50 to 60 percent of the cases. Now note that I had said native previously damaged heart valve. Now why did I say native? Because always remember in prosthetic heart valves infective endocarditis is most commonly caused by another variety of microorganism and that is coagulase negative staphylococcus particularly staphylococcus epidermidis so always remember that name for your exam so what will cause infective endocarditis on previously normal heart valve we have already talked about this and the answer will be staphylococcus aureus and this type of infective endocarditis is seen in 20 to 30 percent of the cases now in your textbook you will also see the Hasek group of bacteria now what do we mean by that so here H will stand for hemophilus A will stand for actinobacillus C for cardiobacterium E for Eichenella and K for Kingella. So these are the Hasek group of bacteria and they are also responsible for infective endocarditis. Now in your textbook you will also see that in 10% cases no microorganisms can be identified in blood culture and that type of infective endocarditis where we cannot identify microorganism that type of infective endocarditis is called culture negative infective endocarditis now what are the causes what will result in such culture negative infective endocarditis there are several causes it may be due to the fact that antibiotic treatment was started before blood culture was done so that's one cause another cause can be if there was any difficulty in isolating the microorganism so that can also result in culture negative result and in many cases the microorganisms can be deeply embedded within the large vegetations and they are not yet released in the circulation so in that situation that will also result in culture negative infective endocarditis so now that we have mentioned the major microorganisms always remember that infective endocarditis can also happen due to gram negative bacteria and also due to certain fungi as well so now we will talk about the predisposing factors of infective endocarditis 
Now, there are three main types of predisposing factors that can lead to development of infective endocarditis. They will include conditions that can lead to transient bacteremia, underlying heart disease, and conditions that can impair host defense. So let's talk about these types of predisposing factors one by one. So the first type of predisposing factor was conditions that can lead to transient bacteremia. Now what do we mean by bacteremia? It means presence of bacteria in the blood. Now it can happen during periodontal infection. Very important cause of periodontal infection is as a result of complication during tooth extraction procedure or during other dental procedure. Periodontal infection can also happen due to trauma resulting from vigorous brushing of the teeth or even due to hard chewing. Genito urinary tract infection is another important predisposing factor that will also fall in this category. So infection of the genitourinary tract can happen as a result of complication during catheterization, cystoscopy, normal delivery or abortion. Now you may be asking me Dr. Robiul, what do we mean by cystoscopy? Always remember cystoscopy is a medical procedure it is done to examine the interior of our urinary bladder and here a very thin fiber optic tube is inserted through the urethra. On one end of that tube there is camera and also light and uh, with the help of that camera and light when this tube goes through the urethra and enters into the urinary bladder, the interior of the urinary bladder can be seen. And as we are seeing here, that during some complication that can happen when this procedure is going, sometimes it can also lead to infection of the genitourinary tract. And ultimately, the infected microorganism can enter the blood and result in bacteremia. Now, infection of the gastrointestinal tract and biliary tract are also important predisposing factors that fall in this category of predisposing factor. And so are surgeries of gastrointestinal tract and biliary tract. During some complication of surgery of gastrointestinal tract or biliary tract, bacteremia can also happen. Skin infection will also fall into this category of predisposing factor. For example, boil, abscess, carbuncles, all these things can result in bacteremia. Upper and lower respiratory tract infection, bacterial pneumonia, all these things will also result in bacteremia. And also remember that uh, during cardiac surgery and uh, cardiac catheterization or implantation of prosthetic heart valve, during all this surgical procedure, there is chance of bacteremia and that can also lead to infective endocarditis. And a very important cause is intravenous drug abuse. This is a very important predisposing factor that will lead to bacteremia and ultimately lead to infective endocarditis. And as we will later see, infective endocarditis that is happening as a result of intravenous drug abuse occurs more commonly on the valves of the right side of the heart. So always keep that thing in your mind for your multiple choice examinations. The second type of risk factor was underlying heart diseases. Specially notable here are chronic rheumatic heart disease with valvular scarring and mitral valve prolapse. Now what do we mean by mitral valve prolapse? It is a condition where the mitral valve gets displaced 
into the left atrium during systole. For example, in this image you can see that this is the left atrium of the heart and this is the left ventricle of the heart and between the left atrium and left ventricle there is the mitral valve and in case of mitral valve prolapse this valve will get displaced into the left atrium during the time of systole. Now a lot of congenital heart diseases will also fall into this category of risk factor for example ventricular septal defect or VSD, patent ductus arteriosus or PDA, subaortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, coaptation of aorta, bicuspid aortic valve, all these will fall into this category of risk factor. And always remember that prosthetic heart valves are also very prone to infection. So they are also predisposing factor for infective endocarditis. The last category of risk factor for infective endocarditis was impaired host defense. And it is obvious because recall that infective endocarditis occurs due to microbial infection. So in any condition when our immune system or our host defense mechanism is not working properly or when it is suppressed, that is the time when the risk of infective endocarditis will be higher. For example, in patients of lymphoma, leukemia, in patients who are taking immunosuppressive therapy because they are transplant patient, or patients who are taking cytotoxic drug because they are cancer patient and in any condition where the function of neutrophil or macrophage is suppressed all these things can lead to impaired host defense and ultimately lead to infective endocarditis so now that we have talked about the etiology of infective endocarditis and discussed the infective organisms as well as the risk factors. Now we will move on and talk about the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis. Now the first step in the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis is entry of the causative microorganism or bacteria into the bloodstream. And we have already talked about the conditions that lead to transient bacteremia when we were talking about the predisposing factors of infective endocarditis. So first the causative microorganism or the bacteria enter the bloodstream. What will happen next? Ultimately the bacteria will reach the heart and there it will implant on the heart valve or on the mural endocardium. And always remember that heart valves that were previously damaged or heart valves that are prosthetic heart valves, they are more frequently infected compared to native and previously normal heart valve. Now, why is that? Why infective endocarditis occurs more frequently on damaged heart valve or on artificial or prosthetic heart valve. The reason is whenever a heart valve gets damaged, it will expose the extracellular matrix proteins. There will be also liberation of tissue factor and all these things will also lead to deposition of fibrin and platelet and formation of thrombus and these are very ideal environment for bacteria to infect and for bacteria to proliferate. That's why damaged heart valves are more frequently infected than normal heart valves. So what will happen next? Bacteria will get implanted on those heart valves or mural endocardium and then they will begin to 
proliferate and ultimately all these things will result in formation of a mature vegetation. So what will be the components of a vegetation? It will contain fibrin, microorganism, inflammatory cells. Now always remember some causative organisms, for example Staphylococcus aureus, can also infect normal heart valves. That is because Staphylococcus aureus is a highly virulent microorganism and they can obtain intracellular access in the endocardium and they will have increased amount of inflammatory reaction. So there will be more necrosis and more tissue destruction when the heart valves are infected with Staphylococcus aureus. Various conditions may lead to hemodynamic stress on the heart valves or mural endocardium and that can also damage the affected heart valve or mural endocardium. And later circulating bacteria may implant on those damaged endocardium or heart valve and result in infective endocarditis as well. Now always remember the vegetations of infective endocarditis will later tend to dislodge and that will result in formation of embolus. Now I have a separate video entirely on embolism and you can also look into that video after watching this video for more information. And the problem with the embolus of infective endocarditis vegetation is that these emboli are infected and that's why they will help in spreading the pathogen even further and that will have some serious consequences in the long run. For example, it may even lead to stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, meningitis, aneurysm, etc. So this concludes today's video on infective endocarditis part 1. I will hopefully upload the second part within a week where we will finish our discussion by talking about the morphology, clinical features, diagnosis and management of this disease. Okay, so that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.